Good morning and welcome to West Church Online. We're so very glad you joined us this morning. My name is Shirley Paz. I serve here on pastoral staff. I'd like to tell you about a few things that are happening here. First of all, we do have three ways to worship. Obviously, one of them is this service right now at 1030, but another one is at nine o'clock on Sunday mornings. Those are our prayer services. Um, they are lovely and they're really a worship event. If you are afraid of praying or think you don't want to pray out loud, you needn't worry. They're filled with scripture and that's a wonderful way to be able to be with others and worship. You can register online, or if you come, uh, you're welcome to join us. Uh, these services are available to you. And then these services are also available at host church sites. You would need to register for these, but we have several places around town in the area that open up on Sunday mornings so that others can join together. And uh, we've had some wonderful experiences of people being able to be together watching the uh, online 1030 service. So uh, the host sites are a great way to connect. Um, also, we just want to thank you for participating in the congregational survey. We got some good information from you and we are taking that into consideration as we make plans to our reunion time, um, which will be happening this fall. You will be hearing more specifics about that very soon. So again, thank you for participating. And then I have some information about our fourth annual backpack drive. This is to help uh, kids in the Haverhill area who might need some assistance uh, with school supplies. It's a great way to really connect and do something wonderful for our community. If you look online, you'll find more information about how to specifically participate in that. But uh, there are several ways, financial giving or actually buying supplies. So uh, again, it's been a great event the past few years and we'd love to invite you to participate again this year. Thanks for that. Well, if you'd like to switch gears with me now, I'd like to read some uh, portions of Psalms. So listen to what God's word is going to say to us. Praise be to the Lord, to the God of our salvation, who daily bears our burdens. Lord, listen to my words. Understand my sadness. Listen to my cry for help my King and my God, because I pray to you. Lord, every morning you hear my voice. Every morning I tell you what I need and I wait for your answer. Let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them that those who love your name may rejoice in you. Would you join me in prayer, please? Lord God, we bow to thank you for the simple and beautiful fact that you hear us. Our words and our needs are heard. And more than that, you care and come into our lives with comfort and guidance, and most importantly, with your presence. You bear our burdens. We are not left alone. Help us to know your goodness, God. Help all those who need to know that you hear them and you answer, and that you are always with us in love and grace. We pray these things in the name of God the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, uh -huh. 
Lost, Lord, you see them all. 
Hello, I'm Dave Curry. I'm delighted to be back here preaching at West Church, uh, if even through camera and online. Some of you may recognize me from having been here a few times in the past few years, as well as having led a retreat with my wife, Sue. My primary ministry context is at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, where I head up the Doctor of Ministry program and provide oversight for our Latino and global ministries. Please join me in prayer. 
Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. All of us have probably told someone or been told by someone, I'll be praying for you. I'll be praying for you. But do we really believe that? Do we ever actually do it? Do we even understand what it means to say, I'll be praying for you? I think there's a range of responses to that. For some people, it's just feeling awkward if somebody shares something difficult and they don't know what to say, sort of like with their fingers crossed, I'll be praying for you, not really intending to pray, but just wanting to get out of the conversation. Now, others of us take it a little bit more seriously, and so when somebody shares something, uh, here, one of the things I do, if it's somebody I don't know, like I'll, I'll shoot a quick prayer. If, uh, say, if Shirley had shared something with me, I'll say, I'll be praying for you. And then I'll say, Lord, bless Shirley. But not really too extended prayer. Now, I, I, I want to show that I, actually I do go a little bit more with that with people that I've developed relationships with that I'm at a distance from that uh, in a probably over-organized way, I have a, a daily prayer calendar that I have on my online calendar to pray for different people uh, each day so that I can say truly that I'll be praying for you uh, once a week, whether you need it or not. And most people say they need it. By the way, Pastor Chris gets prayed for on Sundays, and that's also when I pray for all of you. Now, of course, people that I'm uh, close family or I see every day, I don't need to put on my calendar, and I, I pray for them. So, you know, as a professor, if I was going to give myself a grade for what I mean when I say I'll be praying for you, I guess I'd get like a B or, you know, maybe a B plus on my good weeks. But we all know of uh, prayer warriors who go far above and beyond that, that they pray for a lot more people a lot more regularly in a lot more detail. That they you know, keep a prayer journal where they write down the requests, and then when God answers, and they're just wonderfully supportive folks. And of course, the, the people who are at the, the top end of the curve are, are monks and nuns who are part of orders who, who pray seven times a day. They get up a couple times in the middle of the night, and uh, they when they say, I'll be praying for you, they, they mean it. But what if I told you that there is someone who prays even better than the best monk or nun? Uh, that if there is someone who, when they say, I'll be praying for you, is praying for you not just every week or every day, but all day, every day, fully in the will of God so that what they pray for comes to pass. You'd probably say, Dave, <laughs> who is this and can you get them, get me on their prayer list? Well, actually, you don't have to come to me. You can come to the word of God because that's where we hear about this person. Turn with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 8 verses 26 and 27. Hear the word of God. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. You see, I don't have to twist anybody's arm to get them to put you on their prayer calendar and to get them to pray for you, because if you are a follower of Jesus, 
the Holy Spirit prays for you. Uh, That's what's implied there in verses 26 and 27, where it says the Spirit intercedes for God's people. The Spirit himself intercedes for us. Intercession has the idea of one person going to another person on behalf of a third person, uh, uh, of presenting their concerns and requests. Now, the Holy Spirit prays for us in the mystery of the Trinity. You may think, I've never thought about how God could pray, how the Holy Spirit could be sort of the ultimate prayer warrior. This is where maybe I can help by broadening out our understanding of what prayer is. I I like to think of prayer as attentive, authentic, trusting orientation of the whole person to the divine. Let me say that again. Attentive, authentic, trusting orientation of the whole person to the divine. So I have a kind of a a trick question quiz that I give to my doctoral students when I ask them, what is the first recorded prayer in the Bible? And because they're already Bible scholars and things, they pull out all these very obscure verses. Nope, that's not first. That's not first. I would say that the first recorded prayer that we have in the Bible comes in the very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. And God said, let there be light. So here we have the first person of the Trinity, the Father, speaking and listening are the second person, the Son, or as John tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the third person of the Trinity, the Spirit, who is described in verse 2 as hovering over the waters. That's who's listening. That the Trinity can be thought of as the longest prayer meeting in history that it's actually being at prayer, that that God is always oriented toward one another in that attentive, authentic, trusting orientation to the divine. And that's the way that the Holy Spirit can be interceding for us. In fact, if we read on in Romans chapter 8, verse 34, it tells us also that Jesus is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us, but that's another topic for another day that we see that that prayer is this authentic, attentive, trusting orientation of the divine flowing out of and into the triune Godhead's own eternal interpersonal communion. Well, this is the kind of thing that you would expect to hear from a seminary professor. Let me paint a word picture for you. That The way the, the three persons of the Trinity interact has been described as perichoresis by the earliest church thinkers. And perichoresis is a Greek word that has the idea of a a circular dance that goes together. The choresis part, we get the word choreography from or or chorus line. And my wife has uh, developed a poem that tries to capture this picture of what it's like for the Holy Spirit and the Father and the Son to be kind of dancing together. It goes like this. Christ dancing through day's starred morn to Father's tune and Spirit's horn, inviting us no more forlorn as partners of his fancy. Hearts prancing through our tapping feet, joy glancing as we bow and greet in perichoresis life we meet, entrancing. In this sense, the prayer is simply keeping in step with the Holy Spirit, as described in Galatians 5, 25, who leads us in this eternal dance of the Trinity so that our prayers increasingly echo those of God himself. Now, don't let all this heavy-duty theology that I've just thrown at you tune out the very practical encouragement that comes from knowing that the Holy Spirit prays for us. Because notice, uh, right after verses 26 and 27, I just read, is a verse that perhaps all of us know. And it's one of the most beloved verses in the Bible, verse 28. And we know 
that in all things, God works together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Because the Holy Spirit prays for us, we can be confident that all things work together for good. I love how Eugene Peterson captures this in his paraphrase, the message. Let me read that for you because he shows the connection between the Holy Spirit praying for us and all things working together for good. Meanwhile, the moment we get tired in the waiting, God's Spirit is right alongside helping us along. If we don't know how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. He does our praying in and for us, making prayer out of our wordless sighs, our aching groans. He knows us far better than we know ourselves, knows our pregnant condition, and keeps us present before God. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. I mean, who better to pray for us according to the will of God, as described in verse 7, than God himself? And, And... What exactly is the Holy Spirit praying for us? Well, no one, doesn't matter if you're a theology professor or whatever, knows exactly what the uh, inner communication of the Trinity is about. But there is something that we do know. We, We know that the same Holy Spirit who prays for us inspired the scriptures. And so that we can be praying what's in the scriptures knowing that this is for our own good. It's praying the Psalms, which is the prayer book of the Bible. It's praying for some of the themes that you've been exploring in this series of the Spirit-filled life. It's praying for the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. We know that's the will of God and what the Spirit wants to be producing and is praying for us. Or the Spirit may be praying for the gifts of the Spirit to be poured out in ways that are needed in uh, particular needs of the congregation. Gifts that sometimes are hard to find, such as administration or evangelism or giving. The Holy Spirit prays for us. So we are confident that all things work together for good even in pandemics and economic collapse, political unrest and uncertainty. But the prayer ministry of the Holy Spirit goes beyond just praying for us. The Holy Spirit helps us pray like Jesus, to pray like Jesus himself who prayed through the Holy Spirit. In Luke 10, 21, it says this, at that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. Those same themes are echoed here in the eighth chapter of Romans. In verse 15, Paul writes, And by him, the Holy Spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. Or in Galatians 4, 6, the same theme comes out. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. And you can see how as the spirit prays for us and begins to pray in us that we pray to echo him and to echo Jesus. So as we pray Abba, Father, we move into our Father who art in heaven. That that we're drawn into this ongoing Trinitarian conversation. This may sound a bit blasphemous, but if it helps you uh, understand how God wants us to be involved in prayer, it's as if uh, the Trinity is talking and we come along and they say, hey, look, we were just talking about you. Come on and join us. We want to hear what you have to say. Now, of course, thinking about being in a conversation with the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit makes me a bit tongue-tied just thinking about it. But again, the Holy Spirit not only prays for us, but the Holy Spirit prays in us, particularly when we don't know what to pray for. 
That, that's the point in verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what to pray for, but the, Holy, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. See, the Holy Spirit is the divine helper. Uh, the Greek word that's used in John to describe this, you may be familiar with, is the paraclete, the, the advocate, the one who literally has the idea of comes alongside as the encourager. That same picture is uh, carried on in verse 26 when it says the Spirit helps us, although the word is a little bit different. It has the idea of one who comes alongside, but who bears our burden. You may have heard that image in the psalm that Shirley opened with, of the one who daily bears our burdens. So part of the way the Holy Spirit does this is to come along and bear our burdens in prayer. When we have no words to pray, he gives us, as it's described there in verse 26, wordless groans. And if you read this whole chapter 8, you'll know that that word groan has already come to describe the groaning of creation under sin. In verse 22, or the groaning of new believers being given birth to in verse 23. Now, we're not exactly sure what it means for the Holy Spirit to help us pray in these wordless groans. Some people have described this as the Spirit giving us a, a special prayer language that we don't understand but allows us to express things uh, through the Holy Spirit. This is sometimes called a, a, a prayer language. It's one aspect of praying in tongues. But it, there's a whole continuum here. It's not limited to that. I'll never forget I was interviewing a Pentecostal church leader in South Africa as part of research who said to me, the ultimate logical consequence of tongues is silence. Because if you are truly filled with the Holy Spirit in the full presence of God, you have nothing to say. So the Holy Spirit gives us this ability. It might be in groans. It might be in prayer language. It might be through words. It might be just in silence to pray when we have no words to pray. When we may be feeling overwhelmed by the problems that we see in a fallen world of global pandemics, of economic collapse, of political injustice, of losing our job or a spouse or a child, of dealing with hard things like addiction or world hunger, domestic abuse, seeing people who are hardened in unbelief, of facing a terminal diagnosis of death itself. All these things can overwhelm us, and sometimes we can only groan or maybe pray in a way that we don't fully understand. Let the Holy Spirit guide us. Sometimes he'll give us words, but we don't need the words to pray. We need the Spirit praying in us. Now, of course, we could also be overwhelmed by the greatness of God and not what to say. How can my little words capture the immensity of God's love? And in this sense, that the Holy Spirit prays in us in praise and thanks and worship. It's those spiritual songs that Pastor Chris preached about uh, from Ephesians 5. The third way that the Holy Spirit prays in us is to help us confess even our most secret sins. That's implicit in verse 27, where it says, He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. That the Spirit speaks to our heart, speaks to our conscience. In Romans 2.15, Paul describes that sometimes our conscience accuses us, and other times it defends us. That the Spirit helps us discern what we need to confess, maybe even some things we didn't realize that we needed to confess. And again, this is not God rubbing our nose in our sin, but it's God inviting us to confess these things so we can be forgiven and free. The prayer that I open the sermon with is one that I pray every morning. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. All desires are known. 
and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of my heart that I may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. That's what I want for my day. You don't have to use that prayer, but it's an invitation right at the start of our day for the Holy Spirit to pray into us and reveal those things that we can confess so we can be forgiven. The, the very first part of Romans chapter 8 begins, therefore, there is now no condemnation in Christ Jesus, and talks about the freedom that comes from forgiveness and the freedom that the Spirit brings. Surely, a uh, sermon last week talked about it, so I won't go into detail. And if you haven't listened to it, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to her about how the Spirit brings freedom as he prays into us to enable us to confess our sin. So we see that the Holy Spirit prays for us so that all things work together for good. And the Holy Spirit prays in us even when we don't know what to say. And finally, the Holy Spirit's prayers for us and in us overflow so that the Holy Spirit prays through us. So that our prayers echo his prayers more and more. That part of the way that the Holy Spirit carries out his prayer ministry is through us. As we are praying in the Spirit. And that we echo his prayers most clearly when we pray what he inspired, the scriptures themselves. So let me challenge you in this coming week to take this chapter that I've just taken the heart out of there in Romans chapter 8, looking at verses 26 to 28. Pray that whole chapter. I mean, it starts that no condemnation, and then it ends with, no separation from the love of God. It's a wonderful chapter to pray in a season of great pain and uncertainty. The Holy Spirit prays through us, so our inadequacy should never hold us back from praying for one another, for our neighbors, for the world. The Holy Spirit gives us holy boldness as he prays through us. And again, remember, it's not cheating to ask for help. In fact, that's promised that the Holy Spirit will help us. That's his job. He loves to help us in our praying. Sometimes we hold back from praying because we feel like, I don't have the right words. But again, all you need are genuine spirit-led groans. Not what seemed to be fancy prayer kind of language. You know, Lord, we just come to you in the name of the blood of the Lamb. You don't need to pray that way. Simply let the Spirit pray that even if it's in silence, that's better than trying to make something up. Pray at all times. Use words when necessary. In the end, this means that all of us can say with confidence, in sincerity, and with true understanding, I'll be praying for you. I'll, I'll be praying for you. And that's because the Holy Spirit says to us, I'll be praying for you, in you, and through you. The Holy Spirit says, I'll be praying for you so that all things work together for good. I'll be praying in you, even when you don't know what to say. And I'll be praying through you. So pray with holy boldness. Amen.